Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Cruz, and welcome back to Culture Code. I am very excited today because we don't just have one. We have two great guests. We have Forge Rock CEO, Fran Rosh, and Chief People Officer, Judy Smith. Fran, Judy, welcome. And where are you coming from today? Well, thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much for having us. We are both in San Francisco, California. Love it. I'm normally in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but I'm spending the month in San Jose and I'm so jealous of the weather that you've been experiencing. You know, it's just been beautiful here. So uh, glad to be in your backyard. Well, we're glad to have you here. And Philly's a great town as well. I went to Lehigh University. So there you go. Too far away from Philly and uh, have some nephews there. So it's a great town. Fantastic. So let, let's just start um, high level. Uh, obviously, within uh, info security, everybody knows Forge Rock. But for those who might not be familiar with the organization, what do you guys do in plain language? How big is the company? Tell us about what's been going on. Sure. So we're a digital identity company. So we work with some of the largest enterprises in the world to create identity experiences that are simple and easy and frictionless but also secure, safe, and private. So companies like the BBC, Domino's Pizza, Geico, some of these really large organizations, when you log in, whether you're an employee, a customer, or business partner, that whole login and identity experience, we create software that powers that for some of the largest organizations on the world. In terms of size, we've got about 1,300 enterprise customers. We've got just shy of 1,000 employees. Uh, we're a very globally distributed company, um, and we've got about $250 million in revenue So uh, and growing pretty quickly. So it's an exciting time to be in digital identity and a very exciting time to be at Forge Rock. Love it. Love it. it when you know, We're here, obviously, to talk about uh, great corporate culture. People will define culture in different ways. Often people will say they can they can see great culture when they see it, but it's hard to put into words. But I'm going to challenge you. So how would you describe Forge Rock culture in a, in a few words? How do you, how would you say it to someone, you know, that you bump into that's a friend? What's your culture like? Well, then maybe I'll answer that first and then Shudi can add because she's been such a driver of our culture as our chief uh, people officer. But, you know, we've actually kind of gotten together a group of Forge Rockers to help us define that culture. And we have these pillars that we use. And, and some of them that resonate, you know, most to me, uh, Kevin, is this the four-track culture about challenging the status quo. You know, we always are looking to change and improve. Uh, we're always looking to raise the bar, right? To look at how we perform and what can we do to continue to get better. So for me, when I think of four-track culture, first of all, I think it's critically important. And we've gone through the work of making sure that our employees all are aligned with it, and that we hire and recruit talent that agrees with it. But it's about getting better every single day. Um, so that's what kind of the, culture resonates to me, but I'm sure Shui will say it much better. Yeah, no, that is well said. A couple of things I would add to the culture, because Kevin, you're right. I think one of the things when you get and, and embrace your culture, it can be a secret sauce. It can be the thing others are trying to replicate, but it's really hard to do because it's what you kind of operate and how you exist as a company. A couple of additional things to what uh, Fran said. First is we are a global company but we're not just global in the way that we have offices in different places, but we can operate globally. We appreciate different cultures, different points of view, perspectives, where the roots are of this company, all the way to the places and, and um, kind of talent we've hired around the globe, but we can operate effectively in a global company. I think that's really important. The other two things that I would call out is trust. I think trust is really important. Building safety and trust on teams, building safety and trust with a leader, and doing what you say and saying what you do. And I would argue that one of our pillars about trust is really practiced day in and day out. The last thing I'd say, winning is important. It is so important. And winning for our customers is paramount. It's, it's what helps us continue to exist. But the other thing that we think about is winning with our employees, our partners, and also our communities. We want to leave this place better than how we found it. And I think when you look around at the things that people do with their discretionary time or means, it's giving back. And I think that also starts to define a company's culture when you can endorse that, reinforce it, and support it. Uh, I would say those few things about our culture. I, very, very powerful, um, the, the way you describe it. And just for our listeners, you know, I want to I point out that um, you know, I come from more of a 
uh, an engagement and training background. So I'm always interested in like shaping culture. But um, you know, Fran mentioned you, you mentioned it starts with really like the recruiting and the hiring. And there are people, Jim Collins and others out there, who say, you know, you want great culture. You really need to hire people that fit. You know that that culture that's going to get going to fit. It's hard to train people that don't have those values. You know, uh, you can only go so far. But I don't go quite that far. Um, I think certainly that it starts with the hiring and recruiting, but there are ways we can teach people about uh, what we care about, about our culture and reinforce it. So what are some of the specific ways that you sustain your unique culture? Sure, let me kind of start, tell you a little story how we got here. So I joined the company five years ago. And prior to joining, it was a much smaller company. And it actually kind of had... Uh, kind of a rebel rock and roll attitude as a company, which is great. We all love that kind of rebel challenging the status quo, which we still carry today. But there was also this kind of feeling in the company that they didn't want any big company crap, right? And so when I came in, I've had a lot of big company background. And I said, we are going to spend some time actually defining our culture, defining our values. And like you said, what's important to us and how we want to treat each other. And there were people who said to me, no, don't do that. That's big company crap. You're just going to put posters on the wall that no one ever looks at. And I said, no, like it's, it's, it's not that. You have to define these things because if you don't, how will you know, how will new people who join the company and we're growing like crazy know, how will they crack the code? Are they just supposed to learn? So we said, we are going to take the steps to define it. And then we're going to ingrain it in everything we do. It's not just going to be posters on the wall. So, and when we, we define both our values and our cultural pillars, like every, many other important things, it was very much of a, a bottoms up. It wasn't me saying this is for our culture. It was like, what do you guys like honoring the past, but knowing that we're also changing radically and how do we change for the future? So, you know, that is a lot of how we got there and why I think that we have broad embrace of our values and our cultural pillars because that's how they would develop. And now maybe Shudi can then finish the second part of your question, which was how do we ingrain them? Uh, and how do we make sure, how do we use those values and cultural pillars every day? Yes, and uh, it's a great way to talk about it, Fran, of the roots of the company to where we've gotten today. And you're right that we can put those on a poster or you know write them on the wall, but where do they show up in our practices and our policies and some of our programs, those reinforce your culture and your values. I'll give you a couple of examples of some things that we've shifted and aligned. One is recognition. And look, I think recognition is the currency of creating a culture. I think it's what drives behavior. I think it reinforces what you want more of. And what we did is we took what used to be sort of a tops down kind of nomination based uh, program and we turned it upside down. And what we did is we took all the barriers off of recognition, put um, points and, and sort of rewards into the hands of all of our forge rockers and allow them to recognize individuals, teams of individuals, leaders, people who have impacted them. As they put, pointed out that recognition, they had an opportunity to highlight which cultural pillar that aligned with. So you could understand, oh my gosh, look at that sales development team that's support, you know, saying thank you to the renewals organization. Why? Because you helped us win this deal. And you have this, and it's shared across our company Slack channel. Not only did you give that the freedom to every employee to recognize one another, but we also added the ability to give a high five. We have had over 18,000 moments of recognition and we have had over 71,000 high fives. So while in this virtual world, when I can't necessarily stop by your office and say, wow, I saw that note, good job. But just to see the community saying, this mattered, I see you, it's important. And it reinforces because it's linked to our cultural pillars, what they did to make a difference. So that's one example of how we're doing it. I'll give just one more um, because I think it is important when I talked about this notion of trust. What we also did is we changed our listening strategy a little bit. Instead of sort of keeping just a company survey, what we started to do is quarterly pulse surveys. So we let managers pulse their employees to get their feedback on a small set of questions. They get to debrief with their team and then agree as a team on what to do. I'll tell you how this comes into play. I had a leader um, who was based in Bristol, one of our really wonderful offices at Ford Rock. It's rich in culture and heritage. A leader who had expanded their role and responsibility, but they had done it during COVID. 
they were feeling really disconnected from their team. They could sense engagement was waning. They were having a little bit harder time managing their performance. And they knew cross-functionally, they weren't always showing up well. So by instituting the pulse, it created a safe environment to say, what do we do well as a team? What can we do better? In addition to that, encouraging managers to check in more frequently. So we gave them an architecture to have a conversation, not annually, but at least quarterly. And he came back and said, his engagement scores are up. He's got clear measures of performance and the team's productivity is higher. And guess what? That manager also feels better about the job they're doing for their team. But that's kind of the way we're bringing our culture to life. So much, uh, so much great stuff there. Uh, everything from honoring the past and yet changing for the future is a great way to, to guide uh, an organization through, through change management. Um, we often talk about um, using recognition as strategic recognition. So it always ties back to a value or a goal or a cultural mm -hmm. pillar, mm -hmm. which is just um, re really incredible. And this notion, and maybe I'll poke on in a, in a couple more questions from now, but you know, hearing that it's not just the one annual big employee engagement survey, there's pulse surveys. As things are moving so fast, as companies are growing so fast, asking people how they're doing every 12 months just isn't, uh, mm -hmm. frequent enough uh, anymore. Uh, one of my favorite, um, well, it's almost a hot button issue is the development of frontline leaders because Gallup research, LeadX research suggests 70% of how we feel about work, uh, our, our emotional commitment is going to be tied to back, back to who our manager is. So no offense, Fran, but you can have a great CEO, a great mission, vision, values, but if I'm reporting to a bad boss, they're the filter of everything, right? And so what are you doing to develop frontline leaders who are really, you know, touching more lives, more souls than anyone else in the company? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with you, right? And no matter how much I communicate something, I know that, right, there's a filter there. So what we've done is we really make sure that we cascade all of that through so people do hear it from their direct managers. So I have a great Forge Rock leadership team. Um, and I stay lockstep with them so that what I say, they can also say. And of course, what they say, I say. So it's great. You know, that's about a group of 10 of us. But we also then formed our leadership circle. So our leadership circle is then uh, VP and above um, at the company. And it's a lot of those frontline managers are leading those big teams. So we have a, a, a separate communication whenever there's a big company announcement or a strategy session. We always meet with the leadership circle first, kind of have a dedicated kind of conversation with them so that they can hear it directly from me, directly from the leaders, and then they're prepared and armed to talk to their individual teams. We bring that leadership circle together once a year, um, and we have a three-day retreat, and we spend a lot of time getting to know each other better, aligning, and so to really make sure that those leaders, right, who are the ones who really people listen to, are enabled um, uh, with the most, most information. And then Shuti and her team do a lot of other efforts around uh, leadership and managerial development that she can expound on a little more. Yeah, and I 100% ascribe to that belief that your manager, it drives 70% of your engagement. I absolutely, absolutely ascribe to that. That's why our people leaders have been at the center of our people strategy for over two years now. And we, I think, Kevin, the other place that we've taken is we've even pushed it to kind of what we call people-centric leadership, which I think is about authenticity. It's the ability to be empathetic. It's ability to uh, have, to be an adaptive leader. And also, by the way, get results, right? Absolutely manage performance and get results. A couple of the ways we've done it in developing these, we brought Dr. Mark Brackett in, who talks about emotional intelligence, right? How do I tend to the emotions of, and reactions of my team? And not that I'm there to be the therapist by any means, but just understanding and realizing who, who the people are and getting to know them, what matters to you, what motivates you, where are you at your best? How can you receive feedback, but really helping them to teach those skills? And then Fran talked about Leadership Circle being slightly ahead and making sure that they um, are brought into sort of strategic decisions or we talk to them so that they can then communicate the messages. But the other thing that we've done is when we're anticipating change or things that are coming, we brought in Nathan Furr recently to talk about the upside of uncertainty. 
you know, knowing that this Tomo Bravo acquisition of Fordrock was underway, wanting them to be poised to manage and lead through that change. That's always to me really timely. You can build great year long le learning development programs, but sometimes you get handed something new and you wanna be able to react, react in the, the moment. And the final thing I'd say, just a little bit back to that listening strategy as an example, it's so important to empower your managers. So when I can say to them, it, this is your team's results, I can do something about that. I don't need to wait for Fran, who then I wait for my next leader and wait for my next ship leader. And when they can feel empowered in their roles, they can then see their impact. And so we look at lots of things that we do to more and more and more empower our managers, not only on what they know, but what they can do for and with their teams. Let me ask you. You're, you've already highlighted um, so many great uh, initiatives. You know, from the from the pulse surveys and the way you support leaders, the way you you co-created the the culture in the in the early years, right when you first joined. But are there any particular initiatives that you're most proud of, or that you want to shine a spotlight on that uh, you've been happy when it comes to culture? There's one for me for sure. So every year we get our our kind of a company conference together. Um, a lot of it is the sales and marketing and product leaders, you know, so it's hundreds of people, but we also kind of broadcast part of it live to the rest of the company, um, especially with COVID, right? We've gotten so used to kind of virtual and now kind of hybrid. And as part of that event where, where most of the company or a lot of the company is in person, we do kind of an award ceremony. So we call it the Froskers. Uh, for Jock Oscars, the Froskers, and give out these little gold statues. And it is the most cultural reinforcing event of the year, in my opinion, because each category we, are, we give awards for, a lot of them are tied to our values and our cultural pillars, you know, and also tied to, but, but like we talk about teamwork, but teamwork in these deals. And, and the way that we do it, Kevin, is we have nominees, so you get to like nominate five people, right? So they all get recognition. Then you select a winner and we run it like an Oscars. We, everyone dresses up in tuxedos and gowns and we've got a great stage. And, and when you announce that winner, the audience goes crazy and people literally get up on that stage crying because they've won a Frosker and then proudly display it. And it's this incredible experience to me. Uh, and it's my favorite day of the year to watch the living embodiment of success and how that success is tied to our values and our cultures it, while we have a ton of fun uh, giving out the Froskers. I love it. And it, not only is it fun uh, and great, you know, on that recognition, but something true to you said was, you know, people will do more of what gets recognized. So what a better, what it's the best possible way is like, let's really tie these things to what we want more of and, and celebrate and have fun uh, along the way. Shudi, do you have other things to add? Yeah, I'll tell you, there's one that I am really proud of and it, and it um, uh, has gotten a, a, a lot of press, but uh, internally, when Fran talked about our leadership circle, so we have our top executives, it's about 50 individuals from across the company that we bring together regularly. Well, we brought them together in person for the first time last year to have sort of a, you know, a strategy, people, um, change session. And just before that, we had launched our cultural pillars, which were developed by forge rockers across the globe. But we also know that culture, if it's not lived by the leaders, definitely isn't believed. And so we had this just a month after we had launched our cultural pillars, we brought leadership together in person. Well, I made the price of entry to Leadership Circle that every single attendee produce a one minute video of one of the cultural pillars that meant the most to them. And what you saw was they were creative, they were funny, they were heartfelt. They showed passions or skills we didn't know. One of our leaders playing the guitar, I don't think everybody knew, knew that. And then throughout Leadership Circle, we, we sprinkled them in as we came and went from breaks. And you kind of hear people brought family into it. They brought their passions into it. Like I said, that a lot of humor was used. Some really interesting people with some really good digital skills. We did it. It was a really wonderful way to reinforce and for them to say in their own words, here's what it means to me. And then what we did is we took those videos and we've started to play them at the end of each of our all hands meetings. So at the end of all, we had a minute to a minute and a half where they saw one of their leaders saying, this is what 
winning together means to me. This is what cha challenging the status quo looks like to me. Here's what raising the bar is. Things like, you know, pushing weights up and talking about why it's important to them. And it just really, it had a little bit of fun. Like I said, it was heartfelt, but it, it reinforced these leaders living our culture. I want everyone to immediately steal that idea. I mean, it doesn't matter uh, how big or small your company is. Like, this is something that doesn't take a lot of budget, doesn't take a lot of uh, uh, time to cycles, and is so powerful. Um, we're all, uh, we all use the generic tools, the book on trust, the online learning video for training. There's going to be nothing more powerful than, than team members seeing each other, uh, release some creativity and bring this to life. You're kind of creating your own internal TikTok of culture, uh, with this little program, which is absolutely incredible. This is a short format, uh, podcast. We only have a couple of minutes, but I want to hit you with a couple of fast questions, this is kind of a fun one. Um, let's say you could send a book to every colleague and they guaranteed, they promised they would read it cover to cover. What book might that be? You have a favorite? I'm going to skip a book. I'm going to go to a TV show. I hope nice. you don't know Kevin. The Bear. Oh. Uh, I, and it is about a restaurant transformation, but it is the most business show that I've seen in years. If you really break away the great entertainment value, it is about building teams. It's about setting a vision. It's about developing people. Uh, it is about developing a strategy that everyone agrees with. And for those of you who've seen it, you know that there are some employees that are really resistant to change and want to stay the old way. We have other people on the other end of the spectrum who are like, if we don't change tomorrow, we're dead. And how that leader brings those team members together to set a vision um, and to execute on it. Uh, it is a great business book. And, you know, because every business, you have tough times. It's not always up and to the right. And how they deal with adversity, uh, they use a lot of a lot of rough language, but we try not to use as much of that here at Ford Rock. But every company has adversity and how you plow through it. So please go watch The Bear. Love it for the entertainment, but keep an eye on the business value. Bear season one and two are phenomenal. Yeah, it's a great recommendation. Judy, what? How about you? That's a great. It is a great, great show. I, I'm uh, I'm watching it as well. So I'm gonna I'm gonna shift it up a little bit too, and I'm just gonna say a, in a genre of podcasts that I think are really good is true crime. And you might say, well, for some people, just have a passion and interest, and I do. But what I love about true crime, it's really interesting. I think it really encourages you to look at things from multiple angles. I think they really force you to let go of your inherent biases or sort of the way you believe you're convinced that something is one thing. And I think it pushes you to be more curious. I think it pushes you to stand in other people's shoes to really understand what it might be. And I think it hones in on your critical thinking skills. And that for me, I'd say if you've got any time to just listen to one or two true crime podcasts, of course, Serial put it all on, I, you know, kind of brought it into popularity, but um, they're really quite fun. I, uh, showing my age and nerdiness, you know, my all time favorite classic movie is Citizen Kane and this idea of multiple truths, how someone's life could be told and retold depending on who's doing the, who's doing the telling and what they saw. And there's a lot to, to leadership about that too, right? That's incredible. Uh, let's say you're each given a magic wand, you could wave it in the air and suddenly every one of your teammates got a little better at a particular skill or leaned into a behavior a little bit more, what would you hope that would be? You know, I guess for me is it's the power of team and collaboration. You know, I just being vulnerable, asking for help, asking to help others, just that, that power of collaboration and, and teamwork, I think is something that we do great here at Ford Rock and I'm so proud of, but more and more of that type of thing is, I think it can just really drive us forward. And it's funny, you know, Fran almost took the word straight out of my, my mouth, which is vulnerability. I think he's right. That orientation back to the power of teams and that individuals being vulnerable, turning that into trust and that turning into psychological safety, because it does, it creates that ability, like Fran said, to ask for help, to offer help to be in a place where maybe things are a little opaque, but you're willing to take the hill. You've got a lot of will and you will indeed take the hill. I think trust, authenticity, empathy, um, and vulnerability are really, really uh, great characteristics and they can lead to really wonderful things for individuals and teams. Final question, and I know you have had uh, an exciting week. So what is the most exciting thing about your future now? What excites you most about uh, the next six to 12 months, let's say? 
I think that we're at the cusp of radical changes in the digital identity experience. And I don't know about you, Kevin, but I have hundreds of different usernames and passwords. I have hundreds of different identities for all kinds of websites across banking, shopping, healthcare, government services, media, you go on and on. And I think that our industry and Fordrock has been a big leader in this, is in the cusp of creating a world where you will never have to log in again, where you can just be recognized and have a frictionless experience and get rid of usernames and passwords and get rid of multiple identities without compromising on safety and security and privacy, because there are better, more intelligent ways to recognize that you than a username and password that's been around for 61 years. So I think, you know, Fordrock's been really leading this technology and I'm really excited to see a radical improvement in the user experience while also driving so much better security and privacy in our digital world. Any final words, Judy, on that? That's a hard one to top. I think that was <laughs> well said. And I would just reinforce that that kind of allowing people to simply and safely access the connected world is so powerful. And we're on another chapter. And I think that chapter is going to be amazing thinking about the harmonization of culture and values and how you um, how you really go back to, to, to make even more of a statement in this digital identity world is going to be is going to be ours for the taking. I um, I always uh, tell our listeners that they can often identify strong cultures because companies will come up with a, a unique name for each other. And I heard, and usually it'll get dropped in one of these interviews. And I heard Forge Rockers come out <laughs> as, a, yeah. as a descriptor. So I just want to thank both of you, two obviously awesome Forge Rockers, for all that you've done in the space for changing people's lives by creating a great place uh, to work. And I want to thank you for sharing some of your wisdom with us today. Thank you, Kevin. It was a really great conversation. Thank you, Kevin.